I want to speak to you about creating a culture of discipling. Creating a culture of discipling. Um, let me pray and then I will jump into it a little more. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We pray that you'd help us to pay attention and to think well about your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a, a couple of very miscellaneous notes. This is a, a terrible time of day to have a talk, so uh, I'm sorry about that. I promise you, if I were in your place, I would be falling asleep. Uh, therefore, I've decided to make it easier for you, and I only have 22 points. <laughs> I love you, too. Um, second thing, you'll notice there's an hour and a half listed for this session. I'm not really going to take an hour and a half. Chances are. Um, so. Uh, there's probably going to be an Insta panel we're going to do up here. So another panel that's not in your program, we'll do another panel uh, to take up the remainder of my time. Creating a culture of discipling. Let me give you a couple of distinctions to begin with. Uh, I want to make a distinction between discipleship and discipling. Discipleship is our following Jesus. Danny talked to us from Mark 8 about us being a disciple. So our being a disciple, that's our discipleship. A disciple, that's a, that's a noun. Discipleship, that's a noun. Discipling or disciple making, discipling shorthand is when we turn and help somebody else follow Jesus. And so that's what I'm particularly trying to think about. I'm trying to think about a subset of discipleship which is that part of discipleship where we try to help others follow Jesus. And that's in evangelism and in discipling, evangelizing those who aren't saved and discipling those who are. Number two, are not, sorry, not, these are not the 22 points. Ah, be careful. These are just a couple of distinctions to start with. The second distinction is between my discipling and my leading my church to disciple. Between my discipling, Mark, individual, this guy, and me helping lead my church to disciple. So I've given a talk a number of times at our weekenders, and it's, it's the last chapter in that book that you have called Discipling uh, that's just called something like Raising Up Leaders or how, how I particularly work to try to raise up uh, new elders, how I disciple in that sense. And that is not what I'm talking about in this message. It's similar to that, but it's not exactly the same thing. I'm talking about creating a culture of discipling. So what can we do in our local churches to try to make it typical that people are themselves growing in Christ and that they are themselves trying to help others grow in Christ? So that's what I'm trying to talk about. Not so much what I individually do in my own ministry of discipling, but this is more words to you all on things you can do, and especially those of you who are pastors. Not to do discipling yourself, though some of this will apply to that, but to help create a culture of discipling in your church. Now, of course, you can't make people disciple other people, but you can do things which help to create an atmosphere among your congregation which encourages discipling. And that's what I want to try to communicate with you today. And I want to do it in these just four o'clock in the afternoon after you've already heard two messages, appropriate method of having 22 points. Number one. <laughs> Make the word central. Make the word central. Clean out the other things that the church may be built on. There is a sheerness to the word. Uh, that is helpful. It affronts us. It confronts us. It, it, it assaults us. And when we have the word central in our church, then people are not surprised by the offense that comes from the word. They're kind of used to the word doing that to them. Along with comforting us, instructing us, it confronts us. So make the word central. That, that's the most basic thing you can do to try to create a culture of discipling 
at your church. There really is a God. He's not just our idea. He speaks and we listen. And the fact that we hear and follow him is the very basis, like we were thinking about from Mark 8 earlier today, of what it means to be a disciple. So by having God's word at the center of our church, we create the most basic component of what it's gonna be like to have a culture of discipling in our church. Number two, you wanna make the gospel clear. Sensitize the congregation to what the gospel is. So in our church, very practically, we try to ask everybody who has a membership interview to join our church to tell us the gospel. In 60 seconds or less, what's the good news of Jesus Christ? Uh, we wanna hear them explain to us what the good news is. We wanna make sure that they're understanding, that they're familiar with it. We wanna help them see very specific implications of it because the, the better they know what the gospel is, the more quickly and easily and accurately they, they realize it and recognize it, the better they will be able to see it in all areas of life. The better they'll be able to see intersections of it, their understanding of depravity, their understanding of sin, their understanding of redemption, of hope in the midst of hopelessness, of moral responsibility, of, of identity. I could just go on and on. The better they understand the gospel, the easier, more natural, nearer to them evangelism becomes. Because you don't have to get them worked over to the specific four spiritual law area where then they ask the very specific question like a mouse, you know, coming to a trap with cheese in it. They have to ask that particular question and then you've got them. You know, instead, the more you understand the gospel and its implications in life, so many more things become just natural conduits to real conversations about Jesus and his role in your life. So you help your congregation mature and create this culture of discipling when you help make sure that the gospel is clear in their minds. And that means it needs to be clear in your messages. Make the gospel clear. Number three, make the corporate implications, corporate implications, if you're just writing down brief things, you wanna write down for number three, corporate implications. Make the corporate implications of repentance and faith clear. So, it's been, I've heard, I heard somebody, say, a Christian preacher say recently that, that faith and repentance are like cousins. I don't think that's true. Well, let's say they're like twins. I don't think that's true. I think they're like two sides of the same coin. You know, if you don't have repentance, you don't have biblical faith. You don't, you don't have biblical faith, you, you don't have repentance. Somebody can morally clean up their life, but if they don't trust in Christ, that's not, that's not repentance. You know, somebody can say they're trusting Christ, but if they're not repenting of their sins, yeah, they're, they're not trusting in any biblical sense. You have to be very careful with that. It's very easy to go from that to a kind of legalism, which has no understanding that Christians sin. Listen, all Christians sin. All Christians sin, I don't know about you guys, but in our church, probably even every year. <laughs> no, I'm serious, we do. So we, this might be your day. So, you know, we've gotta be, we've gotta be gracious with each other about that, right? So that means we have to understand that when we're talking about the implications of repentance and faith, and particularly the corporate implications, the implications, what that, what that means in my life, that's both in the sense that I have to be willing to be involved in other people's lives. So I can't say that I really have repented if I'm not evangelizing and if I'm not discipling. Because if I'm not trying to help other people follow Jesus, I don't know what I mean when I say that I'm following Jesus. So if I'm saying that I myself am Mark 8, recognizing Jesus, confessing him as the, the Messiah, the Son of God, if I'm saying that that's me, but I am not turning my life to other people in order to try to help them, then my question is not so much about your understanding of discipling, my question is back about your understanding of the gospel and what repentance and faith really is. So I think we have to understand the corporate implications of repentance and faith, in one of which implies that I have to be willing to be in other people's lives. And the other one 
So in, in that sense, faith, true saving faith is always personal. It's never private. People say it's my own private business. Well, it's fine if you're going to hell. But if, you, if you're talking about the Jesus going to heaven stuff, that's never private. No, that's, that's very much public. That's the nature, it's public. See, Christians all over the world, they get thrown in jail and they die because they won't take the, your line of saying it's private. No, that's, that's a fake Christianity. Okay, the real stuff always is gonna have public implications. It's gonna involve other people. Now this, and that's gonna depend on your stage in life, your personality, circumstances God puts you in, calls he gives you, that's what that means. Doesn't mean everybody stands up in front of a crowd of a thousand people, doesn't mean that at all. Doesn't mean that we're all faithful in exactly the same way every day, doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that the normal stance of our following of Jesus will reach out an outgoing love to others. That that's normal, that that's what it means to be a Christian. And it also means I have to be willing to involve other people in my life. So I have to be willing to say that how I'm doing spiritually is not just my business. Now, if I'm teaching this clearly, do you see how this begins to create a culture that's very friendly to discipling in your church? Because all of a sudden, people are realizing that the basic teaching they're getting here is that their spiritual life is not just their own business that their spiritual business is other people's business. And that that's just basic from, you know, read through 1 John, if you have any questions about that. All right, that's all in number three. Number four, make the line between non-member and church member clear. Make the line between non-member and church member clear. Teach clearly the rights and responsibilities of each member of the congregation. Back to Jonathan Lehman's new book, Don't Fire Your Church Member. We're all called to be a holy people. We know that call from the Old Testament, from Leviticus 11. Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 1. That holiness distinguishes us from those who aren't Christians. And that distinction is our friend. There has been in the last 40 years a movement in church growth to build bridges over and play down that distinction to stress the similarity we have with our neighbors who aren't Christians. Thinking that the more similar we are, the less threatened they'll feel and the safer they'll feel to come ask us questions. I think that's biblically false and been a monumental failure. I think while I can understand the good motives behind it, I think the truth is it's actually our distinction from them while they certainly perceive some similarity, we're humans like them, we face the same troubles they do, but it's their perception of the difference that actually motivates the interest in the questions. So our distinctiveness is actually an important component of our evangelism. So in our church as pastors, we want to make the distinction clear. So at our church, when we had, uh, we had last Sunday morning, we, by God's grace, we installed two new guys as elders. Uh, and we had those who are members of our congregation stand in order to take the vows uh, toward these two new brothers. Well, that very quickly made it clear who the visitors were, they remained seated, and who the members were. I love that. Every time we come up with an excuse to do that in the morning service, I think it's excellent. It just makes it really clear to everybody who the members are and who everybody else is. Now, everybody else may be Christians visiting us from other places. They're on vacation. It may be an old member who's back seeing friends or somebody who's there on business. Maybe a non-Christian neighbor, a Jewish friend who stopped in. But I just think it's really clear that those people stand, they are this local church. It makes it clear. And I think that distinction that some people have felt nervous about is actually very, very helpful. Because when you have that group clearly distinguished, that helps you to lay out particular expressions of love as part of the shared expectation of your congregation. So let's just imagine we were at our church here and whoa, what a nice building this would be. Um, you know, it's not that I expect everybody in this room to behave in a loving way, especially to each other, though in a secondary sense, I certainly do. But primarily Christians and especially those who are members of this local congregation have an expectation on them with each other 
to share Christian love in all kinds of specific ways, to attend the services of the church regularly, to pray for other, those other local Christians regularly. So I don't understand I have a responsibility to pray for you regularly. I do understand I have a responsibility to pray for these people regularly. These people are the members of the Capitol Hill Baptist Church. So in the morning, uh, normally I'll take two pages and I'll pray uh, through those two pages, praying things usually that I've read in scripture combined with what I know is going on in some of the individual's lives. I hope they're doing that as well, all the members of the church. I think when you teach people that all believers are priests for each other before the Lord, that's the relationship he's put us in, that each one has a responsibility to work for the upbuilding of others, then we see the unique role that the member has and how advantageous it is to encouraging sanctification, maturity, growth, and helping each other grow. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, Paul is helping the Corinthians to understand what they should do in their assembly. And he says, what then brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, let all things be done for building up. That last phrase there in verse 26, he repeats that a number of times in this section of 1 Corinthians. Let all things be done for building up. That's how we decide what's to be done because we understand the church is special and the church is there to build each other up. And we wanna go so far as to say that that building up includes correcting and even excommunicating when necessary. Reference our Nine Marks Conference last year on church discipline, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5. That is part of the distinction. We don't try to exercise that kind of care and watchfulness over people who are not members of our local church. But we do pledge, and in our case, we covenant to maintain that kind of care and watchfulness over each other in our local church. So when you teach that kind of clear distinction between member and non-member, and you make the obligations, the responsibility of members very clear, you're not worried that you'll scare people away if you talk about members having responsibilities. You're not worried that you're not treating them like a consumer. You don't mean to treat them like a consumer. They're not shopping at your church. You know, they are there as blood-bought sheep that Christ has in his love put together to covenant with these others. And you're instructing them from the word. That helps them. That will help to create a culture prepared for discipling. Number five, have a shared burden among the elders to model and to check up on individual discipling relationships among the members. Have elders who are discipling. Have elders who care about discipling. Have elders who care about whether the members are discipling. You know, members will often do what pastors do. Members will often do what pastors are excited about. So by teaching and example, the elders can help members to realize that most of their discipling responsibilities and relationships should normally be within the membership of the local church. So when somebody leaves our church to go to another local church, I do not encourage them to maintain all their same friendships in our church. I don't mean you cut them off. I don't mean that at all. I just mean that part of what it means to move to a different assembly is you need to let them get to know you and you need to spend time getting to know them. So pour yourself into those relationships. I think this is how we fulfill our obligation to love each other. I think cultivating this deliberate care inside the membership of the church is the most basic work of the elders. Encourage members of the church to expect to be discipled, to expect that they should be discipling, help them understand it, uh, that it should be weird if that is not their experience in your church. If you look at, at look in 1 Timothy 3, the pastorals are just so useful, aren't they? I mean, I just think from Mark's talk the last hour. But in 1 Timothy 3, when Paul is saying the qualifications for elders, verse 2, 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, therefore an overseer must be above reproach. We think about that a lot. The husband of one wife, infinite gallons of ink have been spilled over that. Sober-minded, yes. Self-controlled, yep. Respectable, okay. Hospitable, oh, let's stop there for a second. Hospitable, uh, the word in the original is phylos, lover, xenoi, of strangers, lover of strangers. 
So I don't know about you, but I think the elders at our church would say that would apply very self-evidently to a lot of the people in our church if we love them. You know, we're being lovers of strangers. And uh, I would encourage you to, to identify men, to serve as elders who are themselves models of this kind of outgoing love that cultivates the good of the people in their congregation. Uh, this, this qualification of being hospitable should mean these are the men who are leading out and establishing a culture of hospitality in your church. And it should mean that you understand that uh, there are ways that when you're agreeing to be a pastor, to be an elder, it will have very serious implications in your life. And that's part of the requirements of the position you need to think of. Yeah, I, I'm struck by sometimes how even very friendly churches aren't very hospitable. Maybe they figure out how to be smiley at the service, but then the whole thing vanishes 10 minutes after the service is over, you know, and the visitors are all just kind of left. Well, just think about what it means to be hospitable. Pray God give you hospitable leaders. Number six, have regular congregational times where examples, and if you want one word here, I'd use the examples, examples, where examples of God's work through each other are shared, examples shared, and thereby spread. So we have a Sunday evening prayer meeting, and we will often begin it with a testimony of grace uh, after we've sung some. Uh, I'll have a brother or sister come up and share something that the Lord has done in with or through them recently. They will have told me about it. I'll ask them to write it up for me in an email. They'll send it to me. Uh, I might go back and forth editing it a little bit, but then basically, good, okay, well, you come share that on a Sunday night, and then they'll stand up and share it to the great edification of the congregation. So cultivate in people an ability to gossip positively, you know, to observe what the Lord is doing and to give him the praise due his name. There is an infinite amount of good things he's been doing in every church represented here just this week. And as pastors, we are the ones who are to draw people's attention to it. And I think when we share transparently both confessions of sin and celebrations of answered prayer, we help the congregation to get to know the member who's sharing, but it also provides an example of how to relate to others. You know, it, it's showing that, yes, we are going to be this real, this open, this honest with each other. And we are giving people an example of the kind of conversations they should expect to have right after the service is over. As they turn and start talking to each other. That's number six, examples shared. Number seven, pray publicly and regularly. Pray publicly and regularly for God to create and bless a culture of discipling in your church. I think even the way you lead in prayer about this will help to uh, determine and define and explain it. So for example, if I were to pray, oh God, help us to inconvenience ourselves to love each other, even as you have given so dearly to love us. Help us to love as we've been loved. You are how we know what love is. Now that's just what Mark is actually part of what he was preaching to us just an hour ago. But when you drop things like that in your prayers constantly, you are edifying your congregation even as you are requesting God the Holy Spirit to change and shape you. Number eight, make applications in your sermon about caring for each other biblically as the shape of love and the definition of discipling. Make applications in your sermons about caring for each other biblically as the shape of love and the definition of discipling. Let me go over to Romans 14. Great section on love. And look particularly at verse 19. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Isn't that interesting? There, there, there's no isolationist hedonism in there. It's mutual upbuilding. Working for your joy is working for our joy. Romans 14, 19. Or if you look at the next chapter, chapter 15, if you look down in verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Friends, that, that's a basic 
cell level life of our church. And I don't think that's so much referring to just like Sunday school teachers. I think that's referring to every Christian with every other Christian. Instruct one another. That's what we're looking for in our church's life. Or famously, you turn it over, over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Look there at verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Bible is clear and we in our teaching should be clear that the love we encourage people to has very specific necessary applications to the people sitting right around them, fellow members of their church. Number nine, very simple one here, teach a course. Teach a course on discipling in order to help equip people who aren't getting the idea by being discipled themselves and in order to help better equip those who are. Number 10, delegate responsibility to others. Delegate responsibility to others. Help folks that you're discipling to, to turn and see the service that they could provide and the encouragement that they come to be to someone else. You know, I, as someone who disciples, I want to disciple not merely disciples, I want to disciple disciplers. I want to disciple not merely disciples, but I want to disciple disciplers. I I want to pour myself in to those people who I think will turn and influence others. I think I have a particular responsibility to that. I don't think those are the only people I have a responsibility to, but I do think I have a special responsibility and I, more than any other member of the church, As the normal public teacher of God's word, I especially have that responsibility. Look over at 2 Timothy 2.2. Very famous verse, always worth appreciating on this topic. Paul says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I love pointing out you got four generations, spiritually speaking, in one verse. Paul, generation two to Timothy. Generation three, entrust this. And generation four, specifically to those who will trust, who will teach others. Paul to Timothy, exhorting him to teach others and specifically to teach those others who will themselves turn and teach others. Four generations, spiritually speaking, in that one verse. Uh, Brother Pastor, we have a particular concern to delegate responsibility to others, to teach them that they have this responsibility and encourage them in it. Number 11, pray for humility. Pray for humility. Mention how other people have helped you to grow. Obviously sit and learn from others. Do you know one of the reasons of the Nine Marks Conference, we always try to have the speakers all sit down here and watch all the messages? Because we're just making a statement to you guys, we know we need to learn too. We're not like conference speakers who like hang out in a green room and just come out and give a talk and then go back and play golf, you know. We're like Christians who need God's word and we need to be fed and, and if, if Mark or Danny are gonna do that, then we're hungry and we wanna eat. Sometimes we get a little full because we get fed a little much and we're not so quick to digest by obedience, but hey, We still need the food. And so we should pray for humility. Obviously sit and learn from others in your church. Uh, Particularly you senior pastors, promote other teachers, both within and outside of your congregation. Uh, If you're not the senior pastor, um, realize that you have areas of responsibility where people respect you and that's where you want to look inside those areas and encourage people inside that who listen to you that you can listen and learn from them. But certainly if you are the senior pastor, uh, people all assume that they can grow from listening listening to you and being taught by you. 
but they may not expect that you learn and grow from listening to them. So I have the experience many times every year of sitting in my church listening to somebody else. Lord, Lord willing, Thabiti's preaching there this coming Sunday. So Lord's Day this coming Sunday, Thabiti's going to be opening up the word to our congregation. And they'll see me sitting there on the front row listening, learning from my brother Thabiti. Uh, and I love them seeing that. It's just right. It's exactly right. And I think when we try to pray for humility, then we help people to see that they can themselves be teachers of God's word. I've often shared the story of me standing at the door at the back after one Sunday and a member comes up to me and he, he shares with me what, what a good sermon, you know, it was and blah, 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 blah. And then he says, and I think he's just putting all that because he has to, he knows me. And then he says, but Mark, you know, I, one thing, I don't really think you preach the gospel. I said, what? He said, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think you really share the gospel. I don't think if I had a non-Christian friend here, they would know how to become a Christian from your sermon today. I said, it was Bill Barron's. I said, Bill, that's ridiculous. You know, what are you, what are you talking about? And so, um, you know, he's a good friend. I could push back like that. So, uh, so that afternoon I went over and looked through all my notes and I went like, man, he's right. I didn't share the gospel very clearly in this sermon. Uh, it's not clear at all. And so I kind of repented right there and thought, man, whenever I'm preaching, I want to be able to clearly share the gospel. Now, I'm not doing that right now because this isn't a sermon. I'm just going to talk to pastors, and Danny did such a good job this morning. But when I preach a sermon, even when I'm preaching in a seminary chapel, I'm always going to try to clearly share the gospel. And I, that came to me not from my wonderful education at Gordon-Conwell, which was a good theological education, but it came from, from Bill Barron standing at the door after the church talking to me, uh, correcting me about what I had done wrong in my sermon. And he was right. And I think when even for me to share that story then helps you. Do you see how that works? Because then you're realizing, oh, so I'm the guy who's not the preacher and I can say something to the preacher that actually teaches the preacher. Yes, you can, you know. So I, as a senior pastor, uh, two times this next month, I'll be sitting there on Wednesday nights listening to other pastors at our church teach our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm delighted to do that. That's a very common thing. Uh, I think along with humility, should come a, a graciousness and a transparency that both humbly admits our own sins openly and is gentle with others and tends to be not suspicious, but to think the best of others. Sin is a terrible master. It's very wearying to those who are trapped in sin. They will present to us the external of being proud and strong and fierce in their sin, but brother pastors of all people, you should know they are exhausted. They are run ragged. And you have to be the one who knows the truth, who looks past that exterior of, of prideful appearance and knows the truth of their destitution before God. And you need to treat them with great mercy, with great tenderness, like a parent, a child, this encourages people to come forward with where they really are spiritually, and it encourages them to press on. All of this is part of what you want if you want to encourage it, creating a culture of discipling in your church, this kind of humble honesty. Number 12, promote good books to help people disciple. Uh, you do this through a church library. Uh, do it through a, a, a bookstall or bookstore at your church. To do it through giving them away. Every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, I try to give away five to 10 good books. So over the last 20 years, people have gotten the idea that there are some names that they always hear, and there are some names they never hear, and both of those are deliberate. You know, <laughs> a lot of teaching gets done through that. Even uh, pictures of books or quotations that you uh, send out on Facebook or Twitter can be helpful. Let people know what you're reading. You know, get them thinking about those things. Good books will help promote a culture of discipling. Number 13, make part of your normal conversations with others openly and directly spiritual. Normal conversation. Uh, part of the goal of loving each other should involve building each other up. And it will entail naturally more sustained, deliberate efforts with some than with others. But discipling, you see, is the natural fruit of the commitment and deliberateness of membership. You're going to be having these kind of conversations with each other that are real, honest, significant, 
open, spiritual, because that's what it means to know each other. That's what it means to be a friend, to have a real genuine relationship. So those things become more and more typical. And when they become more and more typical in your church, well, then they happen more and more by definition. They just keep happening more and more. People are, are posing less and less. They're honestly just telling you, no, I had a great time. It was a way and I'd love to complain for a good story, but nothing to complain about. It was just a great week, you know, or like it was terrible. You know, my wife and I got in a horrible fight and I think I said some things that were cruel to her. Just pray for me to love her better. When those kind of things are not exceptional, but become normal in your church, that means you see that there is a culture of discipling, or at least an atmosphere that's welcome and open and encouraging to a culture of discipling that's being developed. Number 14, <clears throat> encourage your members to understand the concern God has with their lives outside of church, in their family, in their neighborhood, in school, at work. A comprehensive Romans 12, one and two, you know, the, 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 the living sacrifice with our, our mind being transformed. Uh, that's what the Lord is looking for, all of us, uh, the, the totality of us. I think when we do that, we'll help people to appreciate the concerns that God has and we'll open up for discipling those areas that are most, where most of our life is spent. Most of our life is not spent sitting in church. You know, if, if all the points of your discipling somebody is to make sure they're punctual at church, you know, they learn the songs, they take notes at the sermons, and then they greet visitors afterwards. And that's really, oh, that's a mature Christian. Well, I mean, that, that has some good things for four hours a week, but I mean, meanwhile, there's the rest of the week, they're the other six days. I mean, so you want to help somebody think through, how am I called to glorify God uh, working in this laboratory? How am I called to glorify God on the city council? How am I called to glorify God as a police officer, as a janitorial worker, uh, as a teacher in the school? How am I called to glorify God staying home and taking care of the kids? You know, trying to get twins in car seats while their, their backs are arching. You know, how, how does that work to glorify God? Well, well, I think your wife was working to do that. Uh, that, that exactly that is what we as pastors, that you, Brother Mark, you, you did so well, you wanna pull that through in your preaching. You wanna think through how can I give outside of church illustrations of the fruit of the spirit in a way that's gonna help bring these truths home. Because when you do that, then these two, you know, 75 year old brothers don't think they have to learn to talk about predestination in order to disciple each other. You know, it can get a lot easier if they just talk about, you know, how they can pray for each other while their body's hurting, you know, or, you know, how they can pray for each other when they deal with their friend who really just tries their patience. Or, you know, you just get a thousand illustrations from work and home life. You as the preacher should especially be helping them to see and think of those things. Number 15, discourage rigidity. Discourage rigidity of method. For example, some people think it has to be really clear who is discipling whom. So until you register at the church office that Tom is discipling Bill, well, it's not really counting. And by the way, Bill can only be discipled by one person at a time because if he has two different people discipling him, that will confuse him. So there needs to be a clear pyramidal structure, you know, kind of like a Ponzi scheme, you know, where, you know, Tom is the grand disciple of Bob because Bob is discipling Bill and Bill is discipling Tom. So uh, friends, that's, I, you know, that's unhelpful. Uh, it, it's fine for you to be deliberate in your methods, but realize that relationships are a lot more organic than that. And you can strive to do good to 17 different people in the same week. You can be discipling people at various levels of closeness uh, in one-on-one -on -one or small group methods. Um, a certain amount of spontaneity and creativity and willingness even not to measure. I think instead of measuring totals, focus on positive stories of what God has done. Uh, I get asked probably every week in some form or another about my five-year plan. You know, Mark, what's your five-year plan? Or Mark, did you have a five-year plan when you came? And it's on and on and on and on. I've never had a five-year plan. Uh, maybe because I, I was, because I grew up during the Cold War and to me that sounded like, you know, the communists, you know, I just, but it was just, oh, five-year plan, you know, planned famine. I, you know, I just, I, I never, I never wanted to go there. So what I want to do is I want to work very hard on getting right now right. 
I want to work very hard in pouring 100% of what I've gotten right now. I don't know if I'm going to drop dead of a heart attack, the Lord's going to end the world tomorrow, or, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know right now is what I'm responsible for. And then whatever happens, that's kind of fun, surprise, happy land. You know, that's like, whoa, look at what God did. So then what I get to do as the pastor is I get to find examples of this, and I got hundreds of them, you know. I get to find just one or two or three to pick and bring in and show to the church on Sunday. You know, just try to make sure they see these things. Not totals of how many people were in this category, but examples of how people are doing and what's going on. I think you'll get more out of encouragement and growth that way. I think cultures are more pervasive and last longer than programs. I think so often when a pastor sees a need, we're not evangelistic. He thinks, hey, let's grab this program. But friends, I think that's often like putting Saul's armor on David. It's just not very helpful. The poor congregation stands there, now be programmed, you know, but with a heart too little and too confused in evangelism, where if you'd work at its heart for a while, preach messages like Danny did this morning on Mark 8, teach him more about Jesus. Just pump them up for a while, get, give them understanding the importance of the gospel. Preach that, you know, hell is hot and heaven is sweet. I mean, just pre preach enough truth at them for a while, and then it really will not matter what program you give them, they're gonna be evangelizing. Programs can help them do it, but their motivation will not come from the program. Their motivation will be from biblical truths that by God's grace they've perceived. The programs then become servants not the means that they have to have in order to obey. In that sense, what you're aiming at is a culture of discipling in your church. Number 16, beware a wrong dependency developing. Uh, it, it's not good if you become the fourth person of the Trinity in the mind of the person that you're discipling. That's just not good at all. You gotta watch out for that. If somebody is seeming overly dependent on you, just lovingly do things to prevent that and deflate that. And uh, at some point, you know, they're gonna be relating to others anyway, whether you die or they die or you move or they move or just life circumstances change. So just beware of a wrong dependency developing. Number 17, build discipling relationships with the same gender, but with other boundaries deliberately crossed. So, uh, by that, I don't mean you don't teach people the opposite gender. So, you know, men, we definitely teach women. Uh, I am sure I spend more hours, uh, 8.30 to 5.30 each, each week. And for that matter, uh, more time after services, discipling my female members uh, than I do the male members of our church. Uh, that's where my time goes. If you just watch at the door, who has long conversations with me, you watch what emails I get, where my long responses are. Uh, Charles Hedman could testify to this. Who, see as much of it, I think that's, that's much of our pastoral work. But I do mean in the particularly deliberate one-on-one -on -one discipling relationships where you initiate uh, a relationship with someone else one-on-one, -on -one, I think you want to deliberately try to cross boundaries of age, boundaries of race, uh, boundaries of different experiences. You don't want merely to sort of sink into your natural friendships. So natural friendships are great, there's nothing wrong with them, but you want more than that and other than that. Number 18, this is one I think guys often get wrong. Hire staff, and this is about staff, not to take away ministry from members and do it because the staff will do it better now that you've professionalized it, but hire staff to facilitate ministry and thereby multiply it. So I never wanna hire a staff member to come around here and see what a member is doing and go, oh, hey, let me take that, I'll do that better. No, 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 no. What I'm trying to do, the staff, the kind of staff I want to hire are actually going to multiply ministry. So I want them to see this minute member doing ministry and I want them to encourage them and equip them to do it better and do that for other members too. Now, the people who won't like that, ironically, often are the members of your church. They will want a higher level of professional care. Tell them, no, we're going to be a weird American church and spend less on ourselves and our own staff and send more money overseas in missions because there aren't a lot of youth ministers in Saudi Arabia, you know, because there aren't a lot of youth ministers in a lot of places overseas. So we are going to spend less on our own staff. We're so heavily staffed compared to churches around the world. We are going to put more effort into equipping our members to be doing good ministry themselves. And we're going to deliberately work to get more of our money out of our own doors 
to be helping the Lord's work elsewhere where those resources are especially needed. More members as ministers means higher expectations for more members. And that's good at creating a culture of discipline. I'm gonna say that again, more members as ministers means higher expectations for more members. And that's great. That will help people. So the staff then, you don't wanna view so much as professional disciplers, but as professional trainers of disciplers. Again, back to 2 Timothy 2, 2. You know, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Number 19. So you didn't think we'd get done and we're already at 19. Be aware that instituting particular programs, instituting particular programs, that's your sort of memory phrase there, I think, instituting particular programs, through which all of your discipling should be done may have the unintended side effect of diminishing discipling to simply one of five or 10 categories of ministry. And I don't think you mean to do that. So I think rather what you want is a culture that permeates everything your church does. So I do think you can use programs, but I think you have to be careful how you use them, lest they become just one of a number of ministries that somebody's doing at church rather than the way your church does all ministry. Number 20, realize the importance of the regular gathering together of the congregation, both for all the members and especially for you, the pastor. Hang around before and after Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and in our case, Wednesday evening. Work to create a favorable environment, and that would be the, the memory phrase for number 20, a favorable environment for friendship and for discipling relationships to develop. Number 21, understand that your public services are more important for creating a culture of discipling than your small groups. Let me say this again. Understand that your public services, that you're in sin if you don't have according to the Bible, are more important for creating a culture of discipling than your small groups which are a 1970s idea that I think is pretty good, but we don't have to do them. Small groups are biblically optional, but they ministered from house to house. Yeah, I know, but that doesn't mean a small group ministry. You know, that can be a hundred different things. Your main meeting, on the other hand, is hardwired in by scripture. That, that passage again, Hebrews 10, 25, you know, it refers to the regular meeting together and not forsaking that meeting. The way Paul in 1 Corinthians could assume the Corinthians met together on the first day of the week. This is what Christians have always done. And friends, it's that shared weekly experience that generates your congregation, uh, your congregation's culture. That's why you want to make the word central. Uh, and that's how you'll do it. Again, read Jonathan Lehman's book I mentioned earlier, Reverberation. Friends, your, your, your whole congregation meeting together will also give the broadest picture of the congregation and the widest scope for relationships to develop. The teaching should also be better at your public services than it would be on average at your small groups that meet. So your public services are more important for creating a culture of discipling than your small groups. And number 22, be aware of how a decision to have multiple services will make the members of the congregation less visible to each other and therefore effectively less accountable to and for each other. Let me just here at the very end, late in the afternoon, just attack almost everybody. You're asleep, it's a good time to attack you. Yo, Christians in 2016, you're liberal, I mean you're lazy and cheap compared to Christians of 100 years ago when they had a lot less disposable income and built the buildings that we use. I know it's been very fashionable for 30 years now to talk about how carnal it is to spend money on church buildings and how let's just go to, deacons love it when you just talk, let's just go to multiple services. That saves everybody a bunch of money. That's great, it's a good stewardship. I just wanna say I disagree. I think biblically a congregation meets together and I think it helps the congregation in many ways, some of which are in helping to create this culture of discipling. I'm thankful for the saints 100 years ago who built that building on Capitol Hill that we've been using now, uh, week in, week out. They paid for it, they paid down the debt. God bless them. 
you know, we've still been inhabiting it, using it. Uh, I know a lot of church planners who would love to be able to have something like that to be able to use. Friends, if you're a senior pastor, I would ask you just to evaluate, not that you want to make your church ever larger and, you know, you just can't imagine an end to it, but just think how large would it be for, how, how good, what would be a good size for this church in this place? Let's try to work to provide a facility of that size that we control, that if the Lord tarries, the generations after us can use for the Lord's work, we'll be the generation that stands up and takes that, that hard step. We'll try to take care of that for the generations to follow. Friends, that's a heritage to leave your kids that I'm not aware of another person on the planet that's encouraging you to do right now. But I know a lot of people in the past have, and we use the benefits of it all the time. Now, the generations that went before us sacrificed a lot for things that we take for granted and even run down with our words sometime, but we use all the time. That's not saying it's wrong to rent space, and that's not saying you, know, you can't ever do anything else, but I'm just saying, you, hey, here's one thing that I think really does affect the culture you create in your church. It's an awesome thing. The Capitol Hill Baptist Church actually assembles all of it. Not that nobody's absent. I understand how absences happen. But the Capitol Hill Baptist Church assembles every week on the Lord's Day and has been doing that for almost 140 years. And it's an awesome thing to see. And when it's just one of two services, I don't know if Tom and Sally started going to the other service. Or I don't know. Maybe I haven't seen them for a while. I'm not really sure what's going on. It's just the, the culture of discipling begins to get a little harder. The responsibility for each other is just a little, you, you don't want to ask Tom and Sally if they were there. That's a little awkward. You didn't see them, but then you don't go to the same service. Or maybe you did, yet, I don't know. And it just goes on down and down and down from there. So I would encourage you to think of that number 22. And with that, I did not preach a sermon. I just talked to you for about an hour in the afternoon, and some of you did not fall asleep. <laughs> Let me pray, and then we're going to take a five-minute break and have a special panel time. All right? Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help people forget the things that I said that are not helpful and remember all that is good and right and that you would help our churches to get better at this. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.